Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff, and beside me I have two gigantic phones. Yes, both of these are phones. This is the Galaxy Note 2, and this is the Xperia Z Ultra that's just completely dwarfing the Galaxy Note 2. Phones just keep getting bigger. Check this thing out next to my face. It's almost borderlining on idiotic. Now, I'm a really small person, so it's pretty much exaggerated, but really, this thing is huge. But despite its size, I have really loved my time with this phone, shockingly. I've been carrying it around, totally working it, because I don't care what people think. And I think that this is actually a very useful tool. So if you are able to abandon your prejudices and check out what this phone actually offers, I think that a lot of people would actually really like it. So now it's in-depth review time. We're gonna go look at the Xperia Z Ultra, which I have affectionately named Gigantor for obvious reasons. So come on, let's go and check it out. Alrighty, so let's start off with taking a look around this phone. The first thing that I want to mention is that even though this is a very huge phone, this feels really great in the hand. It's actually very well balanced, and because it's well balanced with what Sony calls an omni-balanced design, it doesn't give me the impression of being really heavy. Compared to something like the Galaxy Note 2, it's only about 30 grams heavier, but really, when I'm holding them side by side, it feels like it could be the same weight as the Note 2. So the impression that I get is that it's sturdy and well-built without being heavy, and that's what I really love about this device. That, and look how incredibly thin this device is. This is unbelievable. This is the thinnest device that I have ever had, and it makes it a lot more manageable. If this device was any thicker, it just wouldn't be the same. But you can see here, this is the Galaxy S4, and yes, it is actually thinner than the Galaxy S4. So this is the thinnest phone that I have held to date, and it really compensates for its size. Also, the sturdy feeling has to do with the fact that this frame is made out of aluminum. Supposedly, it's aluminum. That is what Sony is claiming. It's a brushed aluminum finish. It's kind of funny because at first I thought this was plastic. I was a little bit disappointed that they had changed from the glass on the original Z to being what looked kind of almost plasticky. But it's not. It's actually very, very sturdy and stable. And I should know this because the first thing that my mom did when I handed it to her, because she was fascinated about the size, she dropped it against the granite counter. And one thing that I have learned about phones that have plastic bezels, such as the Galaxy S4, I have a small ding right here. I was just walking about in a store and accidentally hit it against an end cap. Don't ask me how. And it made a nice ding in here. But since this is metal, it did not ding at all, even when it hit against the counter. So that's great. It is very sturdy. My one concern would be that the front and back are both made out of glass. But thus far, I haven't had any issues. And if you do happen to break the glass on your phone, it is covered with a shatterproof sheet on both the front and the back. You did hear me right, it is covered with a sheet. So there is a plastic sheet on the back of the phone and also on the front of the phone. And that is supposed to keep glass shards in place if you do happen to break your phone. Interesting concept, Sony, but really not so lovely. They say that these shatterproof sheets have an oleophobic coating on them, so fingerprints are supposed to be easy to wipe off. But as you've probably noticed, this phone is a fingerprint magnet, and I am blaming it a lot on these shatterproof sheets. So if you get this phone, I do recommend carrying around a nice quality cleaning cloth so that you can get rid of all the muck and guck that accumulates on your display, because yes, it will. A big thing that Sony brags about with this phone is that the digitizer is sensitive enough to be able to pick up a utensil on the go, such as a pen or a pencil, and to be able to draw on it. So I'm going to say hello. So you can see that this works very well and this is awesome. But because this is plastic, it actually scratches the crap out of the display. I do not recommend using pencils or pens at any time. I think that you should probably get just a regular stylus, one that is not meant to scratch up the display. I'm gonna do a breath test to show you what I mean. So you can see here, all these lines are actually from using a pencil. So needless to say, my display is now full of scratches and I haven't even had it for a month yet. Not only do these shatterproof sheets scratch very easily, but also the oleophobic coating comes off over time. It hasn't even been a month yet, like I had mentioned, but in places where I am constantly scrolling up through web pages, I'm noticing that that oleophobic coating has just rubbed off entirely. So it's become harder to clean in these places. It doesn't feel smooth. Up at the top of the glass, my finger just swipes easily across the display, but not in places where that oleophobic coating has come off. So you would ask me, who cares? It's a screen protector, right? You can just take them off. Well, yes, yes, actually you can. But the thing is with these shatterproof sheets is that if you take them off, you're going to remove your Sony logo. That's either going to be a blessing for you or it's gonna piss you off, honestly. 
The logo is printed onto this screen protector underneath it. And yes, it comes off. Curiously on the back, all the insignia is underneath the glass. So if you took the protector off on this side, you would still have everything on there. So that's kind of odd, Sony. I really wish that they had a different solution. In some countries, they provide you with a screen protector that goes on top of this screen protector in the box. But the problem is, is I feel that that degrades the screen, gives it kind of a rainbowy type of effect in certain sunlight and can interfere with touch sensitivity. So at one point I will probably just remove this and put a different screen protector on it because underneath, unlike the Galaxy S4 or other phones that you do touch the glass, there is no oleophobic coating. So your finger won't just slide as easily as it will across something like Gorilla Glass. And it's also quite difficult to clean. So either apply a screen protector or take this off and put something else on top of it. Some people have told me that they've talked to Sony representatives and they say that it voids your warranty if you take off the shatterproof sheet because it's meant to be part of the display. But then others have told me that they've sent theirs in for service and Sony just seriously didn't care and they fixed the phone anyway, so I would just take it off eventually and be done with it. If you are particularly curious about this device's size, we're going to do a device pile up right now. We have the original Nexus 7 here, then we're going to take the Xperia Z Ultra and try to get it as centered as we can in the corner. Then we have the Galaxy Note 2. And lastly, we have the Galaxy S4. So this should kind of put things into perspective for you about the size. While it's kind of the size of a tablet, it really doesn't have the form factor of a tablet. It just reminds me of a gigantic phone, which it is. Now starting with the bottom of the phone, we have a lanyard hole right here so that you can hang something like a stylus. You've got your speaker here. This is the only speaker that you have on the entire phone. Now I'm sure this is a compromise because this is a waterproof phone and it just gives it less openings or a smaller opening. It is covered inside by a membrane and that is what's keeping water and moisture out. But because of this membrane, I feel like they've also had to compromise on the quality of the sound as it's not as clear as I'd like it to be or not as loud as I'd like it to be. But with the newest update, the sound has become louder, so at least I'm able to watch TV shows without having to plug my headphones in. You've got your voice microphone right here. You've got another microphone on the top. The microphone at the top is covered with a membrane as well, and sometimes I've noticed during recording that voices don't sound as clear as they should, and that's probably because of the membrane that's keeping the water out. So just keep in mind that this is a waterproof phone and there are some compromises. You've got your receiver or earpiece. You've got a two megapixel front facing camera. You've got your proximity sensor. You've also got your notification LED, which is right around here. You've got a standard headphone jack. What I've noticed about the standard headphone jack is that if you go into the water and plug in headphones after that, sound through headphones sounds pretty staticky until it dries out inside of here but you still can use headphones. You've got your power button, you've got your volume rocker. Now these are the most odd place buttons that I have ever experienced. Now while the power button is all right, my hand would probably normally come to right here anyway, but the volume rocker is just really difficult to find, especially if you are in the dark. I don't know whether I'm pushing the power button or if I'm pushing on that volume rocker, so that can get to be a little bit annoying. On the back, you've got your eight megapixel camera, you've got NFC, You've also got these pogo charging pins. Lastly, we have two flaps on the phone located right here and also right here. This is your micro USB charging port. And then on this side, this one's relatively large. And inside of here, we have quite a few things. The first thing that I want to point out is this moisture indicator. Sony claims right inside of their documentation that if you happen to get water inside of the phone and they see that this is pink, then they automatically void your warranty. They assume that it's your fault. Right here, you've got a micro SD card. You've also got your SIM card tray right in here that you pull out with your thumb. You've also got some FCC information, product information, this little tab right here. This is the 0682 HSPA version. They should be coming out with the LTE version fairly soon. Then the most interesting thing that I see here, do you see that little red square right there? That's actually a reset button. I haven't seen a reset button on a phone since Palm Pilot age. But yes, that is a reset button. So if your phone happens to hang, you can hold that down for three seconds. Also, if your phone hangs, you can hold the up button and you can hold the power button at the same time and it will serve as the same hardware effect. 
So as far as keeping this phone waterproof, the thing that I can't stress enough is to make sure that your flaps are secure. And also what you should do anytime before taking this into the water is make sure that not only are these secure, but to make sure that they're clean. Dust and debris can tend to collect around these O-rings. These are little rubber O-rings and this is what's keeping it watertight. So I recommend something like taking a damp rag and getting rid of the dust or the muck and guck that gets around these. Also make sure that the area where the o-ring is going to slide into is free of debris as well. Just doing that is going to save you from a world of hurt because like I said, if they see that this ends up being pink, they're going to void your warranty without any further questions. You can actually see dust collecting there already. Just once in a while, clean those off. And with paying attention to that, I haven't had any issues with water getting into the phone whatsoever. Now we're going to be getting into waterproof abilities, but there is something that I want to show you first. A lot of people don't ever go and pay attention that there's a manual that you can download online, but they're giving you important product information telling you what this can withstand and what it can't. This phone is IP58 certified, so you can take it down to 1.5 meters in the water for 30 minutes. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, what happens if you take it longer than 30 minutes? I don't know, maybe something will happen, maybe it won't, but all I can tell you is that they don't certify it for any longer than that. They call this dust resistant and waterproof, but you need to be careful what you take it around. They tell you that it's only waterproof in fresh water. So starting here, you can see that it says, do not use your device in the following conditions. It says swimming pool. Now I find this one odd because in their own ad, you see that this device is basically submerged in a swimming pool. I myself have taken this phone and dunked it into the swimming pool at my apartments and it was just fine. So I'm assuming that they are afraid of chlorine interacting with the phone. They tell you do not dive past 1.5 meters or five feet. They also tell you do not take this around sand or mud. Do not take this into salt water. So that means no beach. That means do not take this phone to the beach. Do not get it stuck in the sand. And then they also tell you do not submerge it into other liquids or chemicals. That meaning soap. So I have a friend who had an original Xperia Z, so he took the phone and he assumed, oh, okay, so I can wash the phone then. So he washed the phone, he got it all lathered up with soap, he washed the phone off, and then afterwards he noticed that when listening to sound, it just sounded really muddled through the speaker, as if something had gotten past the membrane. He did his very best to wash it out, but still, even after making sure that there was no debris left in there, it just seemed to have something that had gotten past that membrane, and it ruins the phone. So even though I think it will be waterproof just fine enough if you were to take it to the beach or in the sand, I think what's gonna happen is that you might end up ruining that membrane that's protecting your speaker and your microphones. So don't do it. If you were to take this phone into the shower, just make sure that you're not getting any type of soap or shampoo near it. Now I have taken this phone into the shower with me and what I'm noticing is that it actually works okay in the shower as long as the display isn't entirely drenched where there's water over the entire thing. You can simply just move your arm over it to get rid of the water and it seems to respond pretty well. I was able to answer a text message without too much trouble. So we're gonna do an on-camera water test and I wanna show you some more behaviors of this display right now. With me, I have talking rain sparkling spring water. Now this is all natural. There's just some natural flavorings in here. There's no chemicals. So this is fresh water. It just happens to be a little bit carbonated. I didn't have anything else available. And heck, how could I argue against this? I love berry, it's my favorite flavor. I'm sure that my phone is gonna smell of blueberries. I'm going to turn on the display, make sure that those ports are nice and secure. And here we go. Now the first thing that I noticed when I put the device fully underwater is that the touch screen completely freaks out. Also don't expect to be able to use the phone underwater as far as touching the touch screen because the water interacts with that capacitive touch screen. Now when the display is entirely wet all over the place, it makes it very hard as well to interact with. I notice that I start getting a lot of phantom presses and it just freaks out like right now. So if you can, just wipe it off. Try to get as much water off as possible. Using your arm as a squeegee is really a great thing to do. Yeah, you can see it's still freaking out a little bit. I can confirm that no, my phone is not damaged. It's just because the display is wet. 
Another thing that I want to mention about this phone is that Sony has done some interesting tweaking. They say that there is no new technology inside of this touch screen, making it very sensitive so that you can use pens and pencils. They said that they simply increased the sensitivity of this touch screen. So if you're somebody who has very moist fingers like myself, I've noticed after typing for quite some time that I start getting little moisture spots here and there from my thumbs and the display kind of starts to freak out. So if I'm doing a text message, I'm noticing that it's getting a lot of phantom taps here and there. It's still doing it. But as far as those phantom taps when you have finger oils on the display, that's something that Sony should be fixing. It doesn't feel like it's a hardware problem, but more or less a tweak that they have done. So I'm hoping upon worldwide release that they'll pay attention to that because it's incredibly annoying to be writing a text message. And just because there's oil on the display, it just starts to freak out. So now that the phone screen has dried off pretty well, you can see the touch functionality has returned to its normalcy and it's now working just fine. Now to prove that nothing has happened to this phone, I'm going to open up this flap. I just wanna make sure first that this is entirely dry. Always make sure before opening these again that the phone is entirely dry. So here we go. And you can see that inside of here, you do have a little bit of moisture, not to worry. No water got into the phone. It's just where the water had sat up against the O-ring. But inside here, you can see it's entirely safe. You can see that the moisture indicator is still white and untouched. So indeed it does pretty well. They also say that this can withstand some force going against it. So if you were to move it lightly through the water, water should not get through the O-ring either. But if you take it somewhere around jacuzzi jets, you're probably not gonna be so happy as at that point, it's probably possible for water to get past the O-ring. So just remember, don't take it any deeper than five feet or 1.5 meters for a half hour. Make sure that you're keeping your flaps clean and also realize that, that there is some touch sensitivity issues. I'm hoping that Sony fixes that because when I had first gotten this phone, I didn't have much issue with taking this into the shower. It wasn't getting those terrible phantom taps as badly. I just smelled my phone. Mmm, I've made an air freshener. I really wonder how long it's gonna smell like berry. Now let's get into the main asset of the Xperia Z Ultra, which is undoubtedly the display. It's 6.4 inches, has a pixel density of about 344 pixels per inch. It's full 1080p. Yeah, it's really nice. The size of the display on this phone is what really attracted me. In the United States, carriers have this thing where they want you to have a SIM card for a tablet and you need to pay for a separate plan for that for data. And you also need to have a phone plan with a different SIM card and that has to have its own plan. So that gets very, very expensive. So it's really nice to be able to have a tablet and a phone where I can use a SIM card all in one and not get charged stupidly. This is not something that's an issue everywhere, but this was a deciding factor for me. It's really nice to have a tablet and a phone and not have to worry about everything else. Now compared to the Xperia Z, the Xperia Z had pretty poor viewing angles and it had really terrible color shifting. What's nice about the Z Ultra is that viewing angles are actually really nice finally. It's not a problem. There isn't a lot of color shifting. If this was the Xperia Z sitting down on a table, you would see it look completely washed out. So photos on this display just look absolutely gorgeous and brilliant. And also with this display size, I'm finding that it is a sweet spot. With the five inch display on the Galaxy S4, this is not a small display by any means, but when watching content or playing games, I just felt like I needed a larger display. I needed a greater screen real estate. Well, finally, with the display on the Xperia Z Ultra, I feel that I don't want a larger display. When I'm playing games, it's the perfect size. I can see all the details that I need to. When I'm watching movies, I don't feel like I need to pull it really close to my face to enjoy all the details of the movie. So definitely, this is a sweet spot. It's still small enough to fit in most men's jeans, and I can also fit this in my purse. It's also light enough just to carry around, so I have a portfolio kind of case, and I just carry it around everywhere I go. Before I continue on about this display, there are two links in the description that I want to refer to. I made a video about the Triluminous display, and I also made a video about X-Reality. I covered what those were in some depth and was really able to explain what it is that Sony is doing and how they can make the colors really pop. Sony claims that with the Triluminous display, it looks so brilliant because it can display a wider range of colors as demonstrated by this larger triangle than most LCD screens. You can see that this is a smaller range of colors. These are called a color gamut. Now, while this may be true for their TVs, their Bravia TVs because of the technology, and that's where I would like you to go and watch that video if you take any interest because I explain how they're able to make a wider gamut on an LCD display. 
But otherwise, I did some measurements on this display, and what I found is that it is different than what they claim. What I say to most people is that they're kidding themselves if they think that the hardware is exactly the same in the TVs as is on the phone. It's not. The best that they can do is make some compromises and try to emulate how the displays on the TVs look and try to make it the same with the phones. So while they claim that this phone display is able to show a very large range of colors as seen here compared to right here, that's actually not very true. When I did measurements, I saw that this display is able to display a little bit wider range of colors than something like the HTC One or other really nice screened popular phones, but it's definitely not the color range of AMOLED. What Sony is actually doing to make colors pop is they're adding a lot of processing and they've done some interesting things with the display calibration. I'd be lying if I said that pictures didn't look gorgeous. You look at the colors and they just pop. I was fascinated. I was really wondering what is it that they are doing in order to make things just look so punchy and vibrant? Well, on a very basic level, what they're doing is just say that you have a darker area where you start to see shadows. They're taking it and they're making it even darker. That way it gives an illusion of being very punchy black. And then with colors such as reds, greens, and blues, they're taking colors and they're oversaturating them. So in effect, you get areas of shadow that look really punchy, and you also get colors that look very deep. But this display magic comes at a price. Yes, pun intended, this is a screenshot from Once Upon a Time, one of my very favorite TV shows. Now with the interesting calibration, they really messed around with gamma. And when also when messing around with the saturations, there are some things that look really fantastic, especially landscapes. And then there are things that don't look so nice, such as skin tones. So here we have Regina, and as you've probably noticed, her face, especially on this side, looks very, very bright and washed out. Now, Sony makes a lot of claims. They say that skin tones are supposed to look very natural and very real, but I think that that's just a claim. So bear with me here. In order to make shadows look really punchy, they messed around with gamma and they made it too high. If you have high gamma, then you end up getting darker colors. Well, around skin tones, they ended up making gamma too low. And when you make gamma too low in areas, it makes some colors too bright or washed out. So around areas of skin tones, some people who are very light skinned, unfortunately, their faces look really white or washed out. I noticed this a lot in TV shows. Some things just don't look natural. This may be bothersome to some people, for others it's probably just an experience, but I'm just pointing out that it's not the absolute perfect experience that they're claiming. You can see, obviously right here, that the, the color of her faces is almost as bright as the sky, and that's a little bit odd. So some skin tones end up looking ghostly or white, and I'm not really liking that at all. So some colors look really rich and vibrant, like I said, and then some things just don't look right. But overall, it's an experience. It's an interesting experience. It may not be a natural one, but it's something that a lot of people really like. Sure, if you're really not liking some of the saturations, you can disable the saturations, but what's going on with the punchy shadows and also with the gamma being too bright for skin tones, that never goes away. So I notice in some dark scene movies is that there is no variation in shadows. So instead of there being like a chair in the corner where it's all shadowy and everything, and then you have some people standing in front of that and you can see their faces, all the stuff in the background, instead of being very shadowed, it's all black, it's all blacked out. So like I said, display magic comes at a price. One other thing that I am noticing and that I'm hearing reports on finally to support one of my claims from like a month ago is that there seems to be variations in contrast ratio. Contrast ratio is basically the difference between the brightest brights and the darkest darks. The greater the contrast ratio, the darker the blacks you have basically. So somebody finally responded to my post in XDA and said that they had several different Xperia Zs all together and he looked at the black levels and they all had varying ranges of black levels, but nowhere could he find black not looking pretty gray. So keep that in mind, some are going to have black levels that are better than others. But for people who don't have the best black level, if you're not in ambient lighting, so just say if I turn on the lights right now, looking at it with a bunch of ambient lighting, black looks black right? Ambient lighting is sunlight or lights in the room. You would have no idea that I had a terrible black level. So if you're somebody who's watching movies in the dark, your blacks are probably going to look kind of bluish and lightish gray. And for people who have better black levels, it probably won't look so bright gray. So keep this in mind. 
Now we're looking at display options under display settings. You can see here that I have X Reality for mobile. They finally updated it so I can use X Reality. And I was able to go in, build prop, and just enter in two lines of code and re-enable Bravia Engine 2. So if you check out the link in the description, like I was mentioning before, I made a video about what X Reality is. But basically, the X Reality engine is just like the Bravia 2 engine. All the Bravia 2 engine does really is just manipulate saturations. Now, what Sony added with the X Reality engine is sharpening and also grain. So just say that you're watching content that isn't particularly HD. It adds a lot of sharpening and it seems to add details that don't exist in the first place. All this in order to make things look HD. If the quality was not terrible to begin with, where there weren't a lot of artifacts, especially in videos, then the sharpening isn't terrible. But if you have content that's pretty bad, say if you're watching Netflix, for example, if you have a stream that's not HD quality, the sharpening of the X Reality Engine tends to create a lot of blockiness. Usually with Netflix, if it's low quality, it'll at least look smooth, so you don't have to worry about it looking terrible at being 480p. But with the X Reality engine turned on, it just makes everything look blocky. Facial features look blocky. Everything just looks terrible. So with the X Reality engine, it's really give or take. It's either gonna make some things look kind of cool and HD in appearance, or it just ruins things. So I recommend turning it off if you're going to be watching Netflix. So overall, I love this display. I love the size of it. When the processing looks good, it's good. But like I said, it tends to affect some things like mid-tones, which are skin tones. But overall, the experience with this display is great. Now moving on to the interface and some applications that Sony has included, this phone is stupidly snappy. With a Qualcomm S800 CPU clocked at 2.2 gigahertz, this thing just flies like a bug. Soars like a plane, you know what I'm trying to say. Only very rarely am I getting any type of lag, and I think that this just has to do with the firmware not fully being completely ready. I'm hoping Hoping for worldwide release, I'm not going to see any lags at all. There really shouldn't be at 2.2 gigahertz. This guy has Jelly Bean 4.2.2. Sony has done a little bit of changes here and there. If you use a finger to pull down to see the status bar, you, you can see that you've got a couple different toggles here. There is no dual menu where you pull down once and you see the status bar, and then you pull down with two fingers and see the toggles. No, everything is all together. You do have an option of what you want to see underneath quick settings, and you can drag them and drop them where on the list that you'd like to see them. So just say that you're somebody who really wants to see the brightness toggle inside of here. You can go ahead and select something off and get rid of NFC because there's a certain amount that you can select at a time. And then we can go ahead and add brightness. Now when you pull down on here, you can see that you have access to your brightness toggle. And then you can simply just take care of it at will. Although they're not giving you access to auto brightness, it's simply just an offset. You still have access to your lock screen widgets, so you can add them just like on any other Android phone with Jelly Bean in this past year. And then of course you can easily get to your camera. So all that looks very similar to just vanilla Android. If you hold on to the home screen, you are brought up with several different panels. You have seven panels that you can scroll through to either put applications, shortcuts, or widgets onto. And then below here, you see that you have access to widgets, apps, wallpapers, and themes. If you go underneath apps, you're just clicking on shortcuts. Just say that you can have easy access to contacts or you can have easy access to something inside of Google Books, such as Hunger Games, you can see right here I added as a shortcut. I really like with the Xperia line that you have the ability to choose a theme. When you choose a theme, not only are you changing the lock screen and the home screen, but you're also changing the colors of the fonts, and that carries out throughout the system. On this phone, there are no hardware buttons on the screen whatsoever, so everything is going to be software related with the three dots for a menu. On the bottom, you have three on-screen soft keys. You've got back, you've got home, and you've also got task switcher. The thing that bothers me about the recent applications panel is I can't find any way to just clear all like I can with regular Android. The interesting thing about the task switcher or recent apps panel is that you have this small apps bar down at the bottom. So it works by adding little applications that are able to be added to your home screen or wherever that you are. So if I go under the sketch app or the note taking app, I can go ahead and calculate whatever on the calculator and doodle here and there at the same time. So I think that that becomes quite handy. And then simply I can uncheck it to get rid of it. You have one for a quick note as well, which is nice. You can also add a small web browser, or if you want, you can go ahead and try to add other ones. If you hit the plus icon, you can get some from the Play Store, or there are various widgets that you can add as well to make a tiny app. But honestly, the only real use I would have for this is with the web browser, the note-taking, or the calculator. 
but it's nice that you do have the option to try to pick other ones that might be compatible. Although when you go underneath the Google Play Store, everything that shows up is not compatible with small apps. It usually has to say Sony Mobile Communications and then it will work. So it's a nice idea, but it's not perfect. Underneath the app tray, we have something interesting and new, although I don't know if I quite like it. Normally you just skip through the app tray and you'll be able to access the menu somewhere in order to uninstall apps or do whatever it is that you need. But if you pull from the left-hand side to the right, you can see that an interesting menu bar comes up. You have the ability to search apps, uninstall, you can change the order and categories. What is nice is that you do have access to the Google Play Store from right here, anywhere inside of your app tray. So you can see I can be at the very end of my app tray, pull from the right, and there you go. The only thing that becomes annoying is that, of course, as you're scrolling back and forth, it can become very easy to accidentally activate this menu here. So it's a nice little feature, although sometimes it can get annoying. But once you really get the hang of how to navigate this phone, and since the screen is so big anyway, if you're just mindful, it becomes very easy to not activate it. Under display settings, being an Xperia phone, you do have some interesting little tweaks here and there. During the screen section, I showed you that it has X-Reality for mobile or it has Bravia Engine 2. Now it won't have both at the same time. I actually did my own little tweak to get the Bravia Engine 2 to show up again. But when it's updated, you're going to be having the X-Reality Engine, which I had said before is just like Bravia Engine 2 with processing. The only thing it adds is sharpness and grain. So it tries to make things look faux HD. The other thing that we have down here is optimized backlighting. This reacts like dynamic contrast. It reminds me of what Samsung has, which is auto adjust screen tone. It's meant to help save battery life. So it changes the brightness and the contrast depending on what is displayed on the display. It's an interesting concept if you don't care about the content that you're looking at, but otherwise it kind of makes things in games quite annoying. If you start seeing things that are bright, the brightness is gonna change. And if you look at things that start looking darker, the brightness then changes again. So it does a doo it's kind of bouncing all over the place. So you tend to get brighter, punchier pictures if you turn off optimized backlight. And you don't get alterations in what you're looking at. The last thing that they have entered into here is sketch. And like I had showed you, you can use a pen or a pencil. Regular plastic objects aren't going to work unless it's a stylus that's made specifically for capacitive touch screens. But with pencils, it actually works very well. I can go ahead and tap, create a new document, and I can say, hi, how are you? But as I'm doing this, I'm sure I'm scratching up the display. They really intend it so you can grab any type of writing utensil that you'd normally use on the go, especially if you're a business person. And you can write on the display to make a quick note if you need it. But of course, as I had showed you before, pencils and pens will definitely easily scratch up the shatterproof screen protectors or shatterproof sheets that are on the front of the phone. So I recommend getting a capacitive stylus. There is absolutely no pressure sensitivity. It's not like the Galaxy Note 2 that had like about a thousand degrees of pressure. You have to adjust your pen width and then you're able to do whatever. But it works well and I think a finger is just as good as anything else. Also inside the note taking application, you do have a couple of fun little features. You can import a picture of yourself and you can go ahead and add little facial features like mustaches and pig noses. You can also add caption bubbles. One thing that I really like about this is that you can move around the layers. You can see now that the conversation bubble is behind and I can move around the layers very easily. So I find this to be quite nifty. Once you are done with your creation, you can share, set it as a wallpaper, you can clear canvas or you can discard your sketch. So let's go ahead and set as wallpaper, why not? Fantastic. You do have the option of going in and making things like graphing paper. You can choose the opacity of the lines. You can make white ruled paper and other various engineering type sketching paper. I think this is a fun little application, although it doesn't come anywhere near to what the Note 2 has. If you should ever want to visit your sketches, you can go underneath internal memory and you see that it says sketch. So you'll have a full resolution version of whatever your creation was. So as you can all tell by now, this is a huge phone. So how is the texting experience exactly? Well, you do have a choice to have a one-handed keyboard. With the one-handed keyboard still for people who have very tiny hands like I do, it's just not very functional. So I can just change it very simply to a regular sized keyboard. And even in my tiny hands, I find this to be actually very nice to type on. Since this is a very well-balanced phone and since it actually feels pretty light, my fingers are able to extend across the keyboard without any problems whatsoever. 
And as opposed to smaller phones where your thumbs feel bunched over time from being bent for so long, I think that a keyboard of this size causes less thumb fatigue. I actually really love this. Hello there. How are you? And of course, if you don't like this keyboard, then you're free to download other keyboards. My favorite right now, which would be Swift Key. I'm not really liking the default keyboard so much. I really value when the spacebar is larger. And also when the spacebar is larger, the period is out of the way. So I'm not doing this. Hello, period, there, period. How are you, period? So Swift Key all the way. However, if you do prefer to use the default keyboard, you do have an option right here. This is to use a pen or pencil. Handwriting recognition is actually pretty good, but heck, darned if I'm gonna be using pencils and pens on this display when it scratches so easily. If you're going to be using this, get yourself a capacitive stylus. But anyway, it's already scratched, so I might as well just say test. And you can see that there it goes, test works very well. Now let's talk processors and performance. This phone is insane. This is one of the first phones out of the gate with the Snapdragon S800 processor. It's clocked at 2.2 gigahertz. It has four crate cores inside of it. This thing is a beast. You like my new wallpaper? Yeah, I love Toothless, but I just had to show you my wallpaper. You touch the moon here, and you can hear all the noises of Halloween. I can crunch my pumpkins. I can make the owl who. I can make the spider jump around. I know I am easily entertained, but I, I just had to show you. You can check out the link in the description. This is not an ad or anything. This is just something that I thought was so adorable and I couldn't help but show it to you all. And it runs very nicely on this phone. As for the GPU, we no longer have the Adreno 320. Adreno 320 lasted for so long. Finally, we have something new. It's Adreno 330. This whole phone just purrs along. Gameplay is very nice and smooth. And like I said, the display size is just absolutely gorgeously wonderful that whenever I play games like Need for Speed Most Wanted, it's awesome! It is seriously the best gaming experience on any Android phone that I have had thus far. Now that color calibration is affecting gameplay a little bit, but it looks actually quite awesome in games. When you're playing something like Need for Speed, you have really nice rich colors for your cars. The road looks awesome. It's just, it's a really nice experience. I actually enjoy playing games like Final Fantasy now. Huge display, so thin, so light. It just feels so great. Getting into synthetic benchmarking, which I rarely believe in, but hey, it's something for those of you who must see it. You can see that my device here says 21,719. Now that's versus something like the HTC One, which only was hitting about 12,000. That is a very big leap. We're not gonna talk about Samsung because they tend to cheat a little bit. <laughs> this guy beats butt. So for all those compensators out there, big truck, big house, big phone, big speed. Yes, I compensate for my size. I'm five feet tall, I'm the teeniest little thing, but I'll work it. For those of you who are worried about throttling, if you don't know what throttling is, that means that once the phone starts to get warm, the phone is going to do its best to lower the CPU or GPU frequencies so that it doesn't continue getting hotter. But as you can see here, all you're seeing is CPU throttling, and it's really not so bad. The threshold where it starts throttling at is at 1.5 gigahertz, and 1.5 gigahertz is still incredibly fast. The next one you've got down is 1.1 gigahertz, so I'm really not worried that if this phone starts throttling, it should not lose power, it should not lose its smoothness. But it's really great that they're not throttling the GPU. So if you're somebody who's playing a lot of games and the phone is getting really hot, yes, the CPU is going to throttle, but your gameplay isn't going to be compromised. When I was playing around with the Nexus 4, one thing that I saw is that the GPU would throttle pretty badly and then gameplay would really start to stutter. So you have none of that type of issue here. So to some people, this phone may look like a big stupid oaf, but it's actually very powerful. And as far as being a big stupid oaf, people are really not happy that Sony has included these gigantic bezels here. If you look at something like the Galaxy Mega, it has a screen size that's comparable to this, but it doesn't have these crazy bezels here. Now, while that's annoying to some people, I'm actually really starting to value that because I can easily sit and hold my phone. That Omni Balance feels really great for the balance in hand when I'm sitting in bed or if I'm just watching content. And I don't ever have to worry about touching the screen. So it kind of reminds me of a Nexus 7 2013 edition where you can easily hold it at the bottom, you can easily read content, you're not disturbing or touching the screen. So there really isn't so much to complain about with the bezel. I really do think it serves its purpose well. Moving on to battery life, what a lot of people are going to be wondering about is, yeah, this phone is huge. Yeah, the display is huge. Yeah, it's really powerful. But how does it do on battery life? 
a lot of people are freaking out about the size of the battery. It's 3,000 milliamp hours or officially 3,050 milliamp hours. And Sony made the choice to make this a very, very thin device. I was very skeptical in my initial testings, but actually after using it for quite some time and getting a chance to really understand this device and how it uses its power, it looks like the S800 chip is a lot better than the S600 as far as using up so much power. On a single charge, I was easily able to get through the day. It says 17 hours, 13 minutes, 31 seconds on battery. And you can see that screen time on is five hours and 40 minutes. In a worst case scenario where I took this phone and just drained the crap out of it until it was dead, you can see that there's a very steady line going downwards where I was browsing the web, playing games, watching lots of content on YouTube. I was still able to get five hours of screen time out of this thing. So it may look like it has a small battery relative to its size, but don't let it fool you. They've also got some advanced power saving options such as stamina mode. Stamina mode is basically going to disable mobile data and it's going to disable Wi-Fi when the screen is off. So when the radios are off, it means it's not going to be constantly having background data expending a lot of power. You do have an exceptions list. So I would just say that it's very imperative that you're always checking your email. You can choose to have an exception, such as your email, to continue running. So I won't miss any of my messages. But obviously, if you keep background data off, you should be expending less battery power than if you have certain exceptions like Gmail on. Of course, even with stamina mode on, you don't have to worry about missing phone calls or text messages. All those things will still come through. But as soon as you turn the screen on again, you're going to have your emails and everything pushed onto the phone. So if you're having a day where you really need to conserve power, you can go ahead and turn stamina mode on and just have your applications updating when the screen is on. If you want to save even more battery power, like I showed you before, you can check on this optimized backlight setting. For performance in games, I don't think this is so nice when it's on because especially during games, I mentioned that when you're in areas in the game that have different brightness, you're seeing the brightness level of the display go up and down. But if you're in a crunch, that really helps as well. As far as call quality, it's nothing to write home about. I've had several other phones that seem to be a lot stronger with call quality. I would tend to blame the membranes. The call quality just isn't incredibly crisp and clear like I'm expecting from phones these days, but it gets the job done. One thing that's annoying is that I do hear high frequency noises coming from the receiver from time to time, but it's not a constant thing. It happens sometimes and then it stops and I don't hear it again for the entire phone call. As far as stuff like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GPS, I haven't had any issues whatsoever. It was very simple to pair my phone with my grandparents' Sony DVD player, and I was easily able to throw content to the TV. It worked perfectly. People tend to ask me a lot about reception or data speed, but honestly, all that is going to vary depending on your area, depending on the signal in your area, depending on the speed of your Wi-Fi. So that's such a relative question, but for me, I haven't noticed any issues with reception. I really haven't had any problems whatsoever using it as a phone or dropping calls or getting my data stream. So it's just been a joy to use. Now, as far as all things audio, a lot of you are going to be happy to know that there is indeed an FM radio on this thing. That was one thing that a lot of people were quite annoyed with that wasn't included on the Galaxy S4. So yes, if you don't want to use data, you do have access to an FM radio, which is pretty nice. Now, checking out some audio measurements from GSM Arena, I found it interesting that once you plug in headphones, the stereo crosstalk raises significantly. Stereo crosstalk is basically the leakage between the left and right audio channels. If they end up leaking an incredible amount, you end up getting mono. So their main complaint is that when you use headphones, you do have a bit of stereo crosstalk. And also there's a little bit of distortion, but honestly, the experience is pretty good. Unless you're a complete audiophile, I don't think you're gonna have any issues whatsoever with the quality on this phone. The one thing that bothers me though, is when I have headphones plugged into the jack and I don't have anything playing, just in the right channel, I hear some ticking some low frequency ticking. But as soon as some type of content is playing, that ticking goes away. So if anybody else has this issue, I'm curious. It's not a huge deal because it does go away when audio is playing, but it's slightly annoying. The other thing I notice when listening to music over headphones is that audio isn't overwhelmingly loud. It seems that I really have to punch up that volume quite loud to get a very nice volume level. I wouldn't call it a problem, but for those of you who really like loud music, the audio tends to be a little bit on the quiet side. I believe that I mentioned earlier that because this is a waterproof phone, you do have membranes that cover the speaker, and I believe that that is compromising the sound quality a little bit. There is only one speaker on the bottom of this phone. At first glance, it may look like this is a speaker and that this is a speaker, but definitely not. There's just one speaker. The quality is okay, and it does run on the quiet side, the weak side as well. Although with the newest update, I 
I am seeing that it's getting a lot louder than it was at first. So for the overall media experience, I recommend using headphones. And overall, it's a pretty decent experience. Also, when recording videos, I can't say that the audio quality is the best. It sometimes will sound a little bit muffled. That might have to do with the membrane that's in here keeping it watertight, but it also might have to do with the pure size of this phone. It's often very easy to accidentally palm on top of the microphone, and I myself am guilty of doing that. So I find that it's best to hold the camera this way instead of on its sides. Okay, camera time. So camera on this phone, the thing that you must know about this is I feel like the camera is just a bit of an afterthought. I wouldn't call this camera absolutely phenomenal and I would not compare it to other cameras on the market, but it does get the job done. The camera is eight megapixels, so it really can't compete with the likes of the Galaxy S4. What I'm also noticing with pictures is that they tend on the really blue side and color rendering just doesn't look quite right. The sharpness is nice, however, in pictures. In a moment, I will show you some comparisons between the Galaxy S4, but let's look at the camera interface. Your main means of controlling the camera is up in the left-hand corner. You can see that you're given a menu bar with various options. You've got superior auto, you've got normal mode, you've got video camera, burst, picture effects, which just gives you real-time picture effects. You've got sweep panorama, you've got scene selection, you've got front-facing camera, and you've also got front video. I think that the camera interface is a little bit awkward. First, you need to make a selection, so just say that you want superior auto. Now, in order to control the parameters within this one setting, you would then hit your settings right here, and you're giving the settings that are applicable only to this particular setting. So if you're inside of superior auto, you have an eight megapixel camera, but what's annoying is that you're dropped down to seven megapixel resolution. Otherwise, you've got common various settings. If you go underneath normal, you do have more settings here. You can see that you have exposure compensation, you've got access to HDR, and then again you've got your menu that is applicable to only this one setting. So pay attention to everything that's going on. You can see that you only have a max of 7 megapixel resolution. If you go back and turn off HDR, you can see that you do climb up again to the 8 megapixel resolution. So for most things on this camera, make sure that you realize that unless you're using the very, very basic, you're going to be getting 7 megapixels and not 8. Going back under settings, we're gonna go ahead and select video camera. And again, of course, you go under here to select your various settings. Now for video resolution, you have the option of a 16-9 aspect ratio. It's full HD, 1080p. I don't think that they select this as the default, so pay attention to that. Otherwise, you've got 720p, you've got a four-thirds VGA, and you've also got video resolution for MMS. A mode that I really liked for video blogging in particular is that just with the back-facing camera, that 8 megapixel back-facing camera, you can choose different kinds of focusing modes. You have the option of object tracking, single autofocus, or face detection. Now when vlogging with the back camera, I did use the face detection, and when it's closer to your face, it doesn't do a very good job detecting your face, so you're better off using the single autofocus if you're going to use this as a vlogging camera. And then the mode for object tracking works okay, but then it tends to meander off and go in the middle of nowhere sometimes. Right now it's doing pretty well with the object tracking, but I still think that the best mode is just going to be the continuous autofocus. Up here you have your gallery and then down here you can switch your camera view. So that's just going to switch to the front facing camera. Hello! The quality of the front facing camera is okay. It's nothing amazing or spectacular, but it also does the job. The white balance isn't overly horrible either, so you can use it as a video chat camera if you'd like. So now we're going to start looking at some pictures. I'm going to be comparing the Galaxy S4 to the Xperia Z Ultra. On the left hand side we have the Z Ultra and on the right hand side is the Galaxy S4. The version of the Galaxy S4 here is the AT&T version, but it has the international i9505 ROM custom that has been placed onto it. So it also has the same camera firmware as the i9505. So this is the most representative version of the Galaxy S4. Now with this first picture here, the thing to notice is how blue the picture of the Z Ultra is. The sand is supposed to be an off gray and you can see that the Galaxy S4 does a much better job balancing the red, greens, and blues. Where it's pretty obvious here with the Z Ultra just how blue things are. But overall the colors are going to be up to a matter of taste so who am I to say which one looks better although I prefer the Galaxy S4. Now here we have the same picture of the Xperia Z Ultra and it has been zoomed in quite a little bit so that you can try to see the details in the image. Now you can see in this image that there really aren't so many details once you start to zoom in. It is an 8 
megapixel camera, so that is expected. But then you check out this image of the Galaxy S4 and you can see every grain of sand. You can see all the details of this little feather here and all the details and grains in the rock. I find it a real pity that they didn't include a 13 megapixel sensor over the 8 megapixel sensor because once you see the details that are included in the 13 megapixel sensor, you just don't want to go backwards. But the thinness came at a price and also they didn't include a flash. So they really weren't thinking of marketing this phone as a camera, but more or less as a business entity or a tablet. So I can understand why they stepped down on the camera, but honestly, it just hurts so bad inside. Even though this is only an 8 megapixel sensor and the pictures are a little bit overly blue, the saving grace of this camera is that it takes actually pretty sharp pictures with its 8 megapixel camera. That's something that I can't really say for the Galaxy S4, at least not the i9-505. Even though the i9-505 captures a lot of detail, the pictures just aren't sharp enough. I find the images of the Galaxy S4 to be just a little bit too soft. But if you're somebody who's wanting to work with the pictures or edit the pictures, it becomes very obvious very quickly, especially in these pictures here, that you're coming at quite a loss with only 8 megapixels. Hey everybody, this is Eric the Technology Nerd Like the Film Stuff, and this is actually a second camera test because I don't know if the first one worked very well. Right now I am in Washington, I actually moved to Washington, and this is La Push Beach. This is the La Push Beach that they used in Twilight. I don't really care all that much about Twilight, I'm more of a Harry Potter person, but since I live here I figured out why not just come here anyway. It's very, very beautiful. So thank you everybody for watching. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. I hope you had a good look into what it's like to use this as a phone and the quality of it and just how much of a beast it is. This is a phone that I really love and I would like it if people can abandon their prejudices of huge phones and see what these types of phones really have to offer. If you have some questions about things that I haven't answered in this review, please ask them down below. This is quite a promising phone. It's my daily driver for right now. And I just don't know if I'm going to see a phone with a screen that's bigger than this. So we'll have to see what tops this for me. Have a good night. Bye!